David Ross. Shout out to David Ross, coming to the mic. My name's David Ross. I'm a member of Vietnam, Ve Vietnam Veterans Against the War and Veterans for Peace. In 1965, in the spring, I heard a rumor of war. I'm going. I'm in Germany. Speck Innovation Joyce, hop in East Scoot. I got a Volkswagen with a Porsche engine. I found a town full of Irish, Scotch, and Welsh mill girls. I got a colonel retired. Doesn't care if I go climbing in the Alps, take a few days here and there. I got it made. Volunteered to go to Vietnam with my buddy Ken. I came back and coached. Ken came back in baggage. So I was discharged on the 4th of July, 1967. I got the paperwork to prove it. So when I was a kid, we went to a place um, called White Castle to get these new little 12 cent hamburgers, which would be so delicious. But we had a black friend with us, John Chambers. They wouldn't let him come in. And one of our, one of the parents had a uh, business. They let us use the mimeograph machine. We made all these posters up. Don't eat it, white asshole. They don't serve black people. Well, boy, we had a meeting with the principal, the business guy, our parents, everybody. We told them, no, we're not gonna stop putting these up. So that's where I got started, in Cincinnati, Ohio. I moved up here, and um, anyway, I spent two years in Vietnam. I volunteered to go. Nice, safe job, combat medic infantry, if you can imagine that. So I came back. I was still kind of nominally supported the war, but once I found out what was really going on from the students, I turned against the war. Then I thought with Karen DeCrow, she was one of the founders of NOW, the National, Women, uh, National Organization of Women. She talked to me about sexism. We had a long day together. So that was it. I was against sexism. I'd always been against racism. Now I'm against the war. Well, you ever saw Marlon Brando's movie, The Wild Ones? Motorcycle gang takes over a small town out west someplace, and they're just racing hell. And his business guy comes up to Marlon Brando, and he says, hey, Come on, you know, this is a great country. What are you against? Marlon Brando says, what do you got? And that's where I am now because we're destroying the environment. I'm against everything. But I'm for something. I'm for social transformation. I'm for changing this country. We have so much here, and so much of it just stays right up on top of they suck more out of the bottom. We have, here's your homework assignment. You go home and you get on YouTube, and you put in this search. The U.S. is not number one anymore. See what you come up with. You'll come up with a lot of stuff. We are so far behind. There's little tiny third world countries you almost never heard of. Their infant mortality rate is significantly lower than ours. Uh, I'll leave you this final thought. Two women that impressed me. No, not Hillary Clinton. I'll throw in Poyesti and sure as a hell not, um, yeah. Forgot her name for a moment. The former, our former female ambassador to um, Jane Kirkpatrick, and somebody asked her if they thought all the kids that died in Iraq from her, which my closest friend is Iraqi, um, lives here with me. She's got a toddler, an infant. Can't get her husband in the country. She's got a master's in English from St. Mike's, an internationally traveled uh, person, and she's on her death sentence at home. So that's America, the stuff that we do. So you look this up. You see what America is. This is what the sending kids like me to go fight and die for? So these two women, one was the, um, a doctor, a female doctor in Sweden. And the television, American television interviewer said, uh, aren't you really uncomfortable with the amount of your income that you pay in taxes? She said, no. She said, don't you pay like half your income in taxes? She says, sure. Well, doesn't that make you angry? No, why? Because we have free medical care, free daycare, everyone has housing, everyone eats. Um, we're not afraid to go on our streets at night because nobody needs to bother you because everybody gets what they need. And because of that, people feel they're part of a big family. We all take care of each other and everybody wants to contribute. The other one was the Prime Minister of Iceland, who at that time was a woman. Iceland's the one that sent their crooked bankers to jail. They sent them to prison. Um, you know, the banks didn't even pay back the money they stole. And they asked her, when you pass legislation, when you make a law, what criteria 
overrides your decision-making process. And she replied, when we pass a law, the first thing we ask, what effect will this law have on our children and what effect will this law have on our, their children's children? That's what I want to see from America. I want to see a big family. I want to see us take care of ourselves and start sharing some of this wealth around the world so other people can bootstrap up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So once again, we are all here gathered in this public space to amplify. And I just wanted to shout out a few voices that, that will be represented here. Big shout outs to Megan Emery, professor of French at UVM, will be giving a, a talk here. Shout out to James Mark Lees, and that's a patent lawyer in South Burlington, member of the National Lawyers Guild, and served on the NLG delegations to Gaza and Venezuela. That's a big shout out to be touching the mic here. David Furzee is professor of music at UVM and vice president of United Academics, the faculty union at UVM. Also, Muhammad Abdi, where's Muhammad? I just saw, Muhammad is so, so uh, actually in presence, like doing the work in the background, uh, uh, representing the black perspective and the coalition of solidarity, for solidarity, and he'll be here giving a speech, or giving a talk right up next. And then Tanya Vihovsky is a licensed social worker and a newly elected state representative from Essex. She is a member of the House Committee and Government Operations. So we'll, these are the voices that you'll be, uh, that will be speaking here, giving amplification and representing in this demonstration. So just to continue with the amplification, we'll bring up Muhammad Abdi, representing from the Black Perspective and the Coalition for Solidarity. Did I say solidarity? Is that, did I say right? <laughs> all right. All right, guys, uh, thank you all for being here today. I just wanted to start off by uh, letting everybody know that we are on uh, unceded Abenaki land. Um, for those of, those of you who don't know what that means, that means that this is, this is not the white man's land. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about the Coalition for Solidarity. Um, it's a new, a new organization that was uh, started by me and Jimmy. And uh, we have a couple of organizations that are a part of it right now. And the whole purpose of this coalition is to amplify other organizations. That's what our purpose is. So we ourselves do not have any particular uh, goal aside from that. So what we're here is uh, to be a resource for all these different organizations that are here today. And uh, we just want to amplify their voices. And uh, if anybody's interested in, if there's any organization or any individual that wants to be a part of this coalition for solidarity, uh, please reach out to me or Jimmy. Uh, and we can get you started on that. So thank you very much. I just want to talk about that. So the next person who's going to be speaking is Professor Megan Emery. She is a <clears throat> professor of French at the University of Vermont and one of the leaders of UVM United Against the Cuts. Please welcome Megan Emery. She's also vice chair of the South Burlington City Council. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. I'm also a good friend of Jimmy's. And he's been in my life for many, many years working on this. Right? And I just want to give credit to Mohammed Abdi for coming up with the amplifying each other. I love that as a theme. So um, just want to give him credit for that. So happy 4th, everybody, right? It's a big day. And on the 4th of July, it's the day that we celebrate the Declaration of Independence and the birthday of the great experiment that is and continues to be the United States of America. And I am here as a descendant of immigrants as a patriot, a mother, a local official who has fought long and hard for this, among other things, a resident of Chamberlain neighborhood in South Burlington adjacent to the airport, and as a worker and a teacher to talk about the power of words and ideas. Specifically, I am here as an associate professor of French on behalf of the University of Vermont faculty, students, alumni, and community members who support the UVM United Against the Cuts movement. 
and we are fighting for shared governance at UVM, where top administrators have been paying millions of dollars per year on themselves and on their consultants, all while they were announcing the closure of departments and salary cuts for our most vulnerable faculty members, the untenured faculty and lecturers and staff, until we stood up and said, no, no, no to the closure of majors, no to downgrading programs, and we're still working on that, no to gutting our faculty and staff, squeezing us dry and shifting us around like widgets. And we continue to say no to depriving our programs of needed resources and denying us our voice as stakeholders in this great university, your university, our state university. We learned just last week about the poaching of our library's budget by UVM central administration. After years of flat budgets, 0% when the top administrators are paying themselves millions of dollars per year, the libraries consulted and passed through the faculty senate a long, arduous process, I attended those meetings, the strategic decision to cancel an increasingly expensive package subscription to Elsevier Science Direct in order to order individual highest use titles and to serve us better. Well, what happened? Of the $1.8 million that they recouped by canceling that subscription, UVM Central Administration has taken nearly $1.4 million without consulting them, just taken it for other uses. Will we ever know? We have to ask and we have to demand to know. So effectively, the library's careful planning in order to better provide for our learning community, and it's a public library, so this learning community, has been undermined. Libraries are the foundation of democracies and of public universities, and therefore this latest move, on top of all that has happened and been exposed by UVM United over the past 13 months, is a renewed assault on all of us. They are, they're defenders of our democracy. Get to know a librarian if you want to know a true patriot. I, I, really. The great American experiment is one of self-government. And it is dependent on the principle of equality, which is itself derived from solidarity, the theme of today's event. And let me quote from that document that we are celebrating today. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and people are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men and all of us, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now, we know that our democracy is something we have to wake up every day to fight for. We did not win it on that July 4th back in 1776. We did not win it when the British General Cornwallis finally capitulated to American and French forces at Yorktown in 1781, nor in any major military victory since. We win it momentarily, such as when General Washington, that's George, a man not necessarily destined for greatness due to his father's death. He did not have the great education of many of our forefathers. And as a slaveholder, he was a man of his time. But when he recognized his responsibility and voluntarily resigned his commission in 1783 and returned to his farm as a private citizen, democracy won. And let me quote from what he wrote. Here it is. The sword was the last resort for the preservation of our liberties. So it ought to be the first to be laid aside when these liberties are firmly established. Mm -hmm. 
And as he went on to say, having now finished the work assigned me, I now retire from the great theater of action. Words that we should heed. So our democracy is renewed daily through action and we honor our individual and collective legacy as Americans when we honor our soldiers' lives rather than the sword. Thank you, I, it's very fitting we started with a veteran speaking here today. We win when we send our soldiers and all our residents to school and when we give them the tools of learning so that they may better themselves and work toward their promised happiness. Our democracy is renewed in our everyday interactions, in every situation, when we treat one another with respect. When we listen and debate and protect self-expression, a right we earn by being born, as our Declaration of Independence states, simply by being born. When we ensure that everyone has a place at the table and that honest conversation can be held there, we honor our democracy. We honor the daily sacrifices made through the sweat of our brow and our lives for a more perfect union. And as we celebrate the Declaration of Independence, a day marked by righteous anger and love, and we continue to feel it today, righteous anger and love, that is patriotism and service to human rights and justice, we know that our work is not yet done. Self-government continues to be a goal toward which we strive, to which we must give our full attention, our energy and our sweat, and our words. Our public libraries are at the heart of a thriving democracy of and by and for the people. And so UVM United joins you all. We salute you all. And we will not give up until people who are at the heart of this great country have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All who contribute to this effort, thank you too for being a voice for many as we acknowledge the steps we need to take toward the realization of liberty and justice for all. As I wrote to a newly appointed member of one of our committees in South Burlington, our first, who is 16 years old, born to immigrant parents, I wrote, this is core to the social contract of our democracy. All who contribute to our future happiness and shared prosperity as a society should have equal access to the benefits of belonging. And so UVM United will continue to fight for you all, for the state, as we fight for faculty and staff to have a place at the table of shared governance. Happy Fourth. Thanks. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce Wafik. Wafik is a member of Vermonters for Justice in Palestine. Wafik. Thank you, James. Thank you, Muhammad. My name is Wafiq. I'm a member of Vermont for Justice in Palestine. I born refugee in Lebanon. I will ask you, sister and brother, to stick with this occasion. Fourth of July didn't come in 1776, but started on December 17, 73, when a patriot won a garb of the indigenous people and they went and stopped Dutch and English ships on the harbor of Boston. And this is, was the start of a revolution to end the colonialist British and occupation of this land. The second thing, it was the call for boycott of the product tea and the start of no taxation with no representation. Us as a Palestinian, we ask you to stand up with us against the support that the United States and the British give to the colonialist entity of Israel and its apartheid and occupation of the land of Palestine. We ask you to stand up, to stand up 
and support to boycott, divestment, sanctions against all Israeli products until all the apartheid laws and rules of Palestine end. We ask you that no taxation with no representation to stop your taxes that you send the $3.8 billion to Israel that killing our children that you are sending your F-35 that bothers you over here, but killing us in Gaza, killing us in Yemen, on Libya, on Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. There is no independence without the independence of the people. Here around us, the people of color are suffering under different laws and rules of this country. Black and brown people are under different laws on this country, on education, on health care, in housing, and police and justice system, we have to stop that. If they are not independent, equal with equity, there is no independence of this country. We want to hear about your friend. We want to take care of you. We are here for you. We love you. And we won't forget about Perry. A man named Perry was killed last night is what I'm hearing. And they're scared because he's up at the hospital. So if we're gonna talk about amplifying voices, we are going to amplify every voice. Thank you, Morgan. That was very helpful. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Tanya Vyhovsky. Tanya is a licensed social worker and the newly elected representative to the House from Essex. She's a member of the House Committee on Government Operations, and her campaign for the House was endorsed by the AFL-CIO, the VSEA, the NEA, the AFT, VPIRG, Planned Parenthood, the Sierra Club, and Bernie Sanders. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. Thank you to the Black Perspective, the People for S Peace and Security, and the Coalition for Solidarity for bringing us all together. And happy Fourth of July. Today, as we come together, we certainly have some things to celebrate and a lot of work to keep on doing. We are beginning to come out of the last 16 months of pandemic living. The governor has lifted the state of emergency, and many are breathing a sigh of relief believing that the emergency is over. While we do indeed seem to be moving towards COVID recovery and away from immediate dangers of the pandemic, the emergency is not over. It has been going on for too long and it has only gotten worse. Too many people are facing food insecurity, are not sure where their next meal is coming from, and this is an emergency. Too many BIPOC people are dying young because of white supremacy, and this is an emergency. Too many people are struggling to live and even dying because of unmet and unaffordable health care needs, and this is an emergency. We are facing record heat waves, extreme weather events, resource shortages because of climate change, and this is an emergency. Too many people cannot afford to lead dignified lives and are instead struggling and sometimes unable to even keep a roof over their heads. And this is an emergency. Too many people with disabilities are unable to work because of inaccessibility and discrimination. And this is an emergency. Too many women still make less than men for their work and are severely underrepresented in leadership positions. And this is an emergency. Too many people are dying and having their lives ruined as we funnel trillions upon trillions of dollars into endless war, and this is an emergency. As in, and far too many people struggle to vote, participate, be included and represented in the very system of government that has promoted and perpetuated many of these emergencies. And this too is an emergency. 
The COVID pandemic emergency has ripped the mask off and laid bare the reality of our many broken systems and the long-standing emergencies that many have been forced to survive with for centuries. As we look to move forward towards recovery, we're going to face a lot of pressure to just go back to normal. We cannot do this. We must come together across issue, race, national origin, ideology, religion, and personal background to fight for a better tomorrow. Normal has sucked for most of us, and it's gotten worse. We must unite and stand in solidarity with our siblings fighting for workers' rights, with our siblings fighting for racial justice, with our siblings fighting for climate justice, we must stand with our siblings fighting for healthcare justice and economic justice, for land access, for reparations, and everything that we cannot continue to live without. The issues are many, and they are immense. And what we know from history is that when the people come together and fight for each other's issues, we take leaps forward towards liberty and justice for all. And we are none of us free until we are all of us free. The Civil Rights Act did not come about because people in power said enough was enough. No, this monumental win came because the people stood up and demanded it. White women did not gain the right to vote because men in power simply gave it to them. No, they gained this right because the people came together and demanded it. LGBTQ people did not gain the right to marry because the people preventing it decided to stop. No. The Defense of Marriage Act was overturned because the people organized and demanded it. Abusive, dangerous, and exploitive working conditions were not stopped because the bosses and owners one day realized it was wrong. No, unions and workers stood together to demand the protections that many of us take for granted today. People with disabilities were not granted the protections of the Americans with Disabilities Act out of nowhere. Years of organizing and demonstrating made this a reality. And if we continue to come together, we can continue to make things better. Today's issues are far reaching and they touch nearly all of us. And we have the power as the people of this nation and this state to change them all. Our power lies in our ability to come together and fight for one another, to fight for an issue that we may not see as our own, and to fight for someone that we don't even know. Because we cannot and will not simply go back to a normal that was not working. We will stand together because the people united can never be defeated. And together we will win. Together we can once and for all have the dignity, freedom, and justice for all promised in our Declaration of Independence, and we can stop living from emergency to emergency. Thank you. All right, thank you once again for Amplified Voices. We'll have right now the people for police accountability. Really quickly, Christy, for police people, for the police, uh, for police accountability. Welcome. Hello, my name is Christy Delpia. Many of you have seen my face on the news in quite a few other places. I was part of having just cause evictions passed in March. We will be at that again quite soon. But today I am here for people for police accountability. We ask uh, a special, special election to be worn to place a change of the charter the city of Burlington before the voters to provide for an independent community disciplinary board for the Burlington Police Department. This board will hear, have the power to hear and decide complaints, impose discipline regarding police officer action, inaction, or alleged misconduct. 
an independent investigatory office with the power to investigate complaints of misconduct through an amendment of the Charter Sections 189 and 190, setting forth the board selection process, qualifications, composition, members, terms, jurisdiction, and powers and duties, and the office's organization and powers and duties. The language of the amendments to be attached on this petition that we are going around to have signed today. Just Laporte, and there's a few other of us that have these the clipboards. I see Eugene, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, Burlington residents. Yes, Burlington residents. Anybody that's registered to vote in the city of Burlington can sign this, and we ask that you please do. The police have been beating on people. It's, this is not acceptable. We do not need them beating on people and then, or shooting them and asking questions later. We need police to be accountable for their actions. We need them to help our community, not hurt it. And right now, they're not helping us. I know of quite a few people that have had their houses broken into. They're not responding. I have one young lady that I know that her ex-boyfriend, who she has a restraining order on, is right now living in her house. And the police will not enter it and remove him. This is unacceptable behavior. And when they're, they're allowed to get away with it, and we don't need that. We need them to be held accountable. The police commission themselves cannot do that. They can't even get the information they require to help people sort out their problems because the police department tells them that they don't need to give that to them. So if you see somebody walking around with a clipboard today and you're voted, you're registered to vote in the city of Burlington, please do approach one of us and we'd be more than happy to take your signature. Thank you folks. Thank you very much, Christy. So our next speaker is David Furzik. He's a professor of music at the University of Vermont, and he's vice president of United Academics, the faculty union at UV UVM. He's also a board member of the Vermont AFL-CIO and is speaking today for the AFL-CIO. Thank you, David. Thank you, yes. Not actually vice president of United Academics, but I am a vice president of the AFL-CIO State Labor Council, which is Vermont's largest labor organization. And I'm here on that behalf, and I want to thank Mohammed Abdi for inviting the labor organization to speak here today. We see no daylight between workers' rights and the fight for social justice everywhere. We oppose fascism, racism, sexism and discrimination of all kinds. We understand that labor is strongest when we stand in solidarity with others, when we are united as one single working class, regardless of our differences. We will not be fooled by those that want to divide us into antagonistic camps. We know our strength comes from unity, and from this unity comes true worker power. An injury to one is an injury to all. When we allow undocumented workers to accept unfair wages and unsafe working conditions because they are afraid to organize or protest from fear of their own lives, when we direct deafening military flights over our less privileged communities, when we put deadly chemical plants in our black and brown communities, when we bomb brown people all over the planet to control their resource, the oil and gas that are literally killing us, when we have such gross inequality of wealth in this country and in this world that the richest imagine, however delusionally, that they can escape our mutual destruction, we are planting the seeds of our shared apocalypse. Specifically, as residents of Vermont, I'm asking everyone here to call your U.S. Senators, Patrick Leahy and Bernie Sanders, and ask them to oppose the Farm Worker Modernization Act. They've indicated so far some support for this, and it's already passed the House with the support of our representative in Congress. And it's a bit of a Trojan horse. People are selling this as something that would add protections for undocumented workers. 
but in fact it would institutionalize their inequality. It includes provisions like an eight-year plan to apply for permanent residency. And in those eight years, you have to work for the same farmer. You become an indentured servant to that person. And there's no accommodation for injury, which, as you may know, happens to be a kind of common thing on the farm. If you do this for seven years, working for the same employer, that you have absolutely no way to speak out against for fear of losing your path to residency. If in year eight you're injured, that's too bad for you. You're out of the system, you're out of luck, you're out of the country. So we ask that you call your senators and ask them to oppose the Farm Worker Modernization Act. We demand immediate citizenship for all essential workers. They literally fed us and served us during the worst of the pandemic, often at cost to their own lives. We demand a quick and efficient and fair path to citizenship for all undocumented workers. And when you call Senators Leahy and Sanders and tell them you oppose the act, tell them that you want to see stronger legislation that will guarantee these rights for all our workers. We know that the greatest victories are won when organized labor fights with the downtrodden, whoever and wherever they are. The fight for economic justice is the fight for social justice. The fight against worker exploitation is the fight against racism and sexism and xenophobia. Martin Luther King knew this when he went to Memphis. Why did he go to Memphis? to support the sanitation workers' strike. James Baldwin knew this when he wrote in his open letter to Angela Davis. This is in 19-freaking-70. said, as long as white Americans take refuge in their whiteness, so long as their whiteness puts so sinister a distance between themselves and their own experience and the experience of others, they will never feel themselves sufficiently human sufficiently worthwhile to become responsible for themselves, their leaders, their country, their children, or their fate. They will perish in their delusions. And this is happening already, all around us. He saw that in 1970. It's screamingly and terrifyingly obvious now. So I really am grateful to this group and to Mohammed for inviting us, because we have to support all these causes. There is no difference between them. And so keep doing what you're doing, support these other causes. Thank you for coming out here. You're beautiful. Thank you, David. Next, next I'd like to introduce Mohammed Abdi. He will be speaking for the black perspective. Thank you guys all for being here today. We humans come from different places, speak different languages, practice different cultures and traditions. We all understand right from wrong, but the, a gray area does exist. That area is our differences. It can unite us if we make space for it, and it can divide us if we don't create that space. I did not join this fight to only fight my own side. I don't think any of you joined this fight to only ultimately fight each other. Our enemies are different from one another, yet they still are united, even though it's unification rooted in hatred. Skin color will not unite us. Geographic location will not unite us. Religious beliefs will not unite us. Language will not unite us. Only love and solidarity will unite us. Love and solidarity will unite us because love and solidarity are our only common denominator. Our difference in opinion will only create animosity, which will create room for the fall of our love and solidarity. In order to maintain our mutual understanding, we must respect each other 
Of course, if those attributes such as our beliefs and languages create biased behaviors that uh, are, are uh, linked to hatred, then we must address that with dignity and respect. But still, we must understand, we are all biased in one fashion or another. Within independence, you will find unity. When everyone's way of life is respected, you will find peace and a willingness, a willingness to expand one's horizon. Ultimately, everyone wants a better world, but not a world that's only good for them. As a black man, I want you to understand that the hump for us didn't start when Black Lives Matter hit your screen or newspaper, nor did it stop after a white man got 22.5 years for murdering another one of us. When we mourn for life, everyone should feel that. The life we want isn't any different from the one you, you want. If anything, it might already be more challenging. Yet still a life we deserve to keep. The moment we allow people to murder someone, we fail love. The moment we allow people to murder someone, we fail solidarity. When we let people get away with hatred that harms another, we lost our only common unity. We let hatred happen for so long, now we wonder why we're so disconnected from each other's pain. When one of us is in pain, we should all be angry. We should all want to stop that pain. Create procedures to not let it happen ever again. I'm here for you, and of course I expect you to be here for me. Let's come together in the name of love and solidarity. And uh, I just want to say also, in terms of uh, the black perspective, I just wanted to say that uh, there's definitely been some sort of tension going on. And uh, I wanted to just come out and say that I do definitely apologize for any of my shortcomings. Um, because it is very important for me to acknowledge that uh, I did uh, behave negatively in the situation. So I just want to clarify that I do apologize for that. And moving forward, I will work, for, I will work with anyone uh, that is willing to stand by me in my fight for freedom. And I will stand by anyone for their own freedom as well, because it's not just a one-way love, it is a two-way love. So if I'm going to receive love, I'm going to give love. And I appreciate every single one of you guys for being here today. Big respect to Muhammad Abdi, the director of The Black Perspective. And you can tell that Muhammad has been doing some boots on the ground, like really active work because the way he holds the mic, you know, when you're holding a bullhorn, right? You gotta get real on it. So shout out to those who know about that community engagement. If you definitely want to engage within the community through the Black Perspective, be, please see the guy in the yellow hat, <laughs> Muhammad Abdi. All right, so next on the mic for introduction, this is James Mark Lease. He's a patent lawyer in South Burlington. He's a member of the National Lawyers Guild in, and served on NLG delegations to Gaza and Venezuela. He has been a leading member of the campaign to stop the F-35s since 2010. He writes a regular column on cancelf35.substack.com and is speaking today for Cancel the F-35, People for Peace and Security. Please welcome James Mark Lees. Hey, James. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Cargo. Hey, man. James, you're awesome. Uh, homeless guy got... It's like we want to make sure that the, the, the right on, right on. yeah, yeah. No, here's a mic. Here's a mic. Talk about it. Talk about it. Gee, there's a guy named Perry that got the living tar beat out of him over around the corner, and he's a hopeless guy that nobody gets a living tar about. Channel 17. It doesn't matter, man. I don't know how to fuck to work the camera. Hey. hey. And Perry got beat up last night, and literally got beat up. And he's a fucking hey, man. No, man, Perry got beat up by a bunch of goddamn college kids, man. So, f 
Fuck the college kids. I dropped the mic, but I don't want to break. Respectful. Thank you. All right, so what I take from that is that everyone should really show everyone respect, whether young or old, whether in home or homeless, respect should be given to everyone because we're all human beings. So the amplified voice of the community, it's necessary because we all need to hear what's going on. Even if it doesn't come out across as couth as everyone would like, it's the voice of the community. So big shout out to that. I mean, it's very needed. So give yourself a round of applause and back to James for the rest of the introductions. Thank you very much. So 245 years ago today, 56 revolutionaries issued a declaration calling for overthrowing British rule and instituting a government based on the consent of the governed. But slaves did not benefit, nor did the indigenous tribes, nor did workers or farmers or women. It was a revolution that secured power for property owners, the 1%. It took until 1967 when Martin Luther King identified the U.S. government as, quote, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, unquote. He called for a new revolution to abolish racism, poverty, and militarism. We need that revolution now. The facts show climate catastrophe, millions unhoused, a starvation minimum wage, student debt, extreme income inequality, tax loopholes for the rich, a failed health care for profit system, systemic racism, mass incarceration, cops killing with impunity, money in elections killing our democracy, torture, U.S. bombs just dropped on Gaza, multiple endless illegal wars based on lies, and both political parties controlled by a vicious ruling class. We need the revolution Martin Luther King called for here in Vermont to protect 3,000 black, brown, immigrant, and working class families, including 1,000 children and 3,000 affordable, affordable homes that are targeted by the F-35 jets, according to the Air Force's own report on the subject. In that report, the Air Force itself warned that the noise, the 115 decibel noise of the F-35 damaged hearing and impaired learning for children. Since the planes, the F-35 jets arrived almost two years ago, more than 600 people have gone online, filled out a report, describing pain, injury, and distress. Now, the U.S. Constitution <coughs> requires that the training conducted by state national guards conform to the laws prescribed by Congress. These laws and the military's own regulations protect civilians from such military training operations. The hundreds of F-35 training flights each month in a city are illegal under our Constitution and laws. They're immoral, they are unjust, and they have to stop. You cannot say you are protecting democracy while you are ignoring the town meeting votes that happened in Burlington in 2018 and in Winooski just four months ago. <laughs> Burlington called for canceling the plan to base the F-35. Winooski, experiencing the noise, voted two to one to halt the training flights in any populated area. We, including Winooski, 
We need a revolution to restore the consent of the governed. This government in Montpelier is ignoring the town meeting votes, ignoring the rights of the people to determine their future and their safety. The government touts jobs instead. They say jobs is more important than democracy, but that's false. We need jobs that protect the planet, not F-35 jets that destroy it. Did you know that each 35 practice flight in Vermont burns 25 gallons of jet fuel every minute? That's 1,500 gallons an hour. They're practicing with huge amounts of oil to make war for oil. The F-35 is a planet killer on steroids. And that's not even counting the bombs and missiles they're going to be dropping on civilians, just as they've been dropping them in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. The Constitution reserves to each state the authority over the training of its National Guard. The responsibility shifted from the federal government, which under the Constitution is responsible for arming the militia. That was the basing decision. But now it's training the militia, right? And the training under the Constitution is reserved to the states. But when you hear the governor, or when you hear the adjutant general, they won't take that responsibility. They blame the federal. Well, do you know why? Because they know the F-35 is deeply unpopular. They saw those votes in Burlington and Winooski, and they are trying to take to avoid responsibility. <clears throat> But we know that the state of Vermont has the power to halt the F-35 training flights. It's written right in the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution. Instead, the governor is targeting civilians with F-35 jets in violation of law, in opposition to town meeting votes. We have an extremist governor obsequiously subservient to the military industrial complex. We have a compliant legislative leadership that hasn't even put together a hearing to hear from the people in Winooski, in Burlington, in the Chamberlain School neighborhood of South Burlington and in Williston. They haven't heard a single voice from any of the people affected. What's wrong with that legislative le leadership? Where is Jill Krawinski when we need her? She's the speaker. The state is literally assaulting people, planet, law, and democracy itself with F-35 training flights in a densely populated area where it doesn't belong. The governor and the entire state political and military leadership must be held to account. So to make the new revolution, we need solidarity among all of us. We can't win on any issue without that solidarity, but together we can win on all of them. To preserve the planet, to halt the coming wars, to abolish the F-35, and to accomplish the revolution Martin Luther King called for, first of all, we need the same solidarity exhibited by those 56 who signed the Declaration 245 years ago. We need the, that revolution, and we need that solidarity now. Thank you very much. Just a footnote. Not all that long ago, I read with great irony that Burlington has, is making illegal the use of gasoline leaf blowers because they're too noisy. What? Right. So I, I'd like to call up Mohammed. He's going to make some closing remarks. I don't know where he went. Right here. Uh, 
right. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this is the conclusion. So we have some food right down there. We have some petitions that people can uh, sign. Uh, and also, we're just going to make some space for anyone who wants to uh, talk. You can uh, definitely come up and talk because we're here. And uh, in terms of the coalition itself, we're just here to amplify people's voices. So if anybody does want to speak about any initiative, any petition, any, any, anything, really, you can come up and uh, definitely go ahead and do that. Well, we have someone coming up over here. All right, here we go. All right, awesome. everyone, my name is Lee Morrigan. I'm a uh, social justice activist and advocate. I want to thank Muhammad and the Black Perspective. They've actually really been there for me in my latest uh, really entanglement with the law for the first time. Um, about a year ago I started advocating for a missing black man from Barry, Vermont. His name is Ralph Jean Marie. Um, he was reported missing uh, two days after he reportedly went missing. And that's about where the case is at. Uh, a year later, there's been no arrests, no leads, and the first person to be charged in relation to the case is me. <laughs> as ironic as that is, and uh, long story short, I'd be happy to answer questions if for anyone who has them after. I'm not going to go into it too much here, but I very publicly uh, demanded accountability from the police chief and state's attorney at a press conference um, and put out there that I had confirmed a security video was obtained by police and for whatever reason they do not want the public to know that they have a security tape from the hotel Ralph went missing and I'll never understand that I would think anyone would just assume that in a missing persons case where the police have stated that Ralph has pro probably been murdered to me it's just kind of common sense that they would collect videotape from the hotel I, I will never understand why acknowledging that is so dangerous, but it is. So I was called into court under a secret inquest to reveal my sources, and I refused because I feel very strongly that, my, that the sources are at risk of danger and retaliation by the police, and I believe that the reaction of the legal system really confirms that. So, for those of you who don't know what a secret inquest is, it is a crazy, scary tool. So you are called into a legal proceeding, which is secret, and I don't know how this is legal, but you're not allowed to have a lawyer in there with you. So it is literally you, a judge, a stenographer, and the prosecutor. And you are asked to make decisions I was given less than 24 hours notice, so I didn't have time to consult with an attorney. And, you know, so I just did the best I could and I refused to answer questions and I was charged with contempt, um, which in Vermont, you can be jailed for up to 18 months without a trial. Um, and I've had, I just had my second hearing. I'm covered by a journalist law, which the prosecutor knew I was a journalist over a year ago. Um, and he still charged me, which is illegal. And, you know, this, this experience has really shown me, I've never experienced firsthand how systematic the system is to absolutely crush any dissent, especially when you're advocating for a black man. And I remember having this moment of clarity when I was on the witness stand during the secret inquest when I was told you will answer the question or I could send you to jail right now without a trial and I remember just having this moment of clarity where it's like this is what happens when you advocate for a missing black person this is what happens when you have the audacity to demand that the police do something about it and claim some sort of accountability. And, you know, I, 
as my, my hearings are coming and going and I'm waiting for the final judgment, I had this reflection the other day when I was putting my shoes on to get ready to go to my, my last hearing and just like, I'm extremely privileged. I am extremely pri privileged. One, I'm white. Two, I'm not gonna lose my job if I go to jail. My employers have been very supportive and they said, go sit in jail for 18 months. Your job's gonna be here for you. Two years ago when I was supporting myself, I would not have the option. I have a very supportive partner who's been very encouraging. I've had the support of Muhammad and the Black Perspective. I've had really good support from the activist community and just a good part of the community in general as the word's gotten out there. I have a really good mental health care team that's really been an integral part of me keeping it together. But a lot of people don't have these privileges and this would have crushed a lot of people. It is a lot of pressure to have a police department and a state's attorney in the state of Vermont seeking to destroy you. And I never would have been able to appreciate the kind of pressure. And I have more of an understanding now how people get stuck in the legal system and they never get out. And uh, you know, in a way I have to thank uh, state's attorney Rory Tebow and Police Chief uh, Tim Bombardier down in Barrie because they've really strengthened me as an activist and they've really shown me the value of the people in my life and they've really shown me how strong I am and they've strengthened my resolve to hold them accountable. I don't think that's the outcome they wanted, but that's what they're getting. And so to them, I could just say thank you and thank you to all of you. Thank you for sharing your experience. This is what this space is all about. Thank you for everyone being here in solidarity. Thank you for the, the, uh, the alliances that are here, the positive alliances. Evening and hearing, this space is for amplification publicly. It's a public space. Welcome to City Hall Park in Burlington. But also, I'd like to let everyone know that in the, uh, in the other parks and recreative, recreation spaces, such as Battery Park, and a, a lot of uh, protests and demonstrations that happened last summer, that really show the, the alliances in reference to, to standing against police brutality, in reference to what was going on in all the parts of the country. But in Battery Park consistently, we'll be having spaces for amplification. Also in reference to the, uh, the, the, the support from the Neighborhood Planning Association, shout out to wards one, two, and three of Burlington, the Neighborhood Planning Associations gave opportunities for myself in the community to amplify. The sound system that you're hearing being, being put to great use is a part of the community engagement uh, support. Shout out to the Racial Justice Alliance group that's uh, headed by Mark Hughes. Shout out to the Black Perspective. This alliance, this sound equipment, that not to get into too deep of it, I wish I could. I was, to be completely honest, I've been waiting for a moment like this to stand on a soapbox of sorts and talk about an organization that was in the community for umpteen years that had use of said equipment that during the pandemic in the midst of it had the opportunity to amplify the awareness COVID awareness just basic COVID awareness in a underserved community specifically the community of Winooski the city of Winooski that has the most diverse uh, uh, community members like in the state of Vermont from all different parts of, of the of well, you know, I don't want to go into too much of the declarative detail because I like for the space to be held for people who are living in those experiences. So big shout outs to those who are from the community of Winooski, the new American community. But this organization was supposed to amplify during the uh, COVID, times of COVID, it didn't happen. And this is what it was supposed to be about, just letting everyone know, especially in that community, things that are important, processes, even in different languages. So not to get too much into detail, but anyone who wants to talk about it, oh, this is what this space is for, for the introduction and the networking of further amplification. But in Battery Park, on a, a consistent basis, for the last couple of weeks, we've been holding space for amplification, for, and, and that was supported by the Racial Justice Alliance Group and the Neighborhood Planning Association. There'll be the first of its kind, but not the last of its kind, community amplification called the Neighborhood Multicultural Festival. It's much more than a performance space. It's just literally letting everyone in the community and those visiting the community know what's going on in the community and around the community. And creating that bridge between Winooski and Burlington, which desperately needs to happen. Big shout outs to Burlington High School, Winooski High School. Right now, uh, there's a lot of summer programs and activities that's being ramped up post pandemic. 
and the community, it would be well vested to know about it and because that engagement builds everything, that's what community is all about. So this space is amplified for that. Shout out to everyone who has been able to grace the mic and amplify. We're calling out one more time, anyone from the community or anyone who would like to have this public space as a space for amplification. I did hear a community member, shout out to those who are or, or of the community, whether they are home, housed or with their, whether they're without homes, letting us know about some of the, the, the actual violence that can happen in a public space. And there's definitely been um, uh, violence in reference to those who are homeless, literally catching up to what was said. Yes, there was a, there's a big act of violence but on, um, Right, close by, I think it's uh, by the uh, post office, right? It's still there in reference to the scene of it. And that's disturbing. I didn't know that until just now. So just like it's been amplified, the voice of those who would like to share it in a free public space, that's, that's what we welcome here. So thank you. And here's another voice of amplification. I just wanted to say thank you to Lee for advocating for understanding what happened in the disappearance of Ralph Jean Marie and the courage that it takes to stand up in our community against the powerful institutions. And I believe that experience because I've experienced systemic injustice as a union member working in a local social service agency. And at that social service agency, they target union activists very routinely and it is not something that you would expect based on the public image and the uh, professional signage that they sometimes put up. A year ago, I believe that they even put up a banner over Route 7 that suggested that they believe that Black Lives Matter, but there's rampant racism within those institutions. And when people speak out, they're often targeted and marginalized, and it's a very uncomfortable experience. So. Uh, having been through that experience and then also advocating for all of us in our community at the legislative level and having seen how the actions and behavior of legislators is all uh, tangled up with power, powers that be in our society and that if you go into those spaces and you are uh, upset about what's not happening in those spaces that people uh, work to try to quiet you and silence you. I've been yelled at many times by legislators and I've been yelled at inside of this building by legislators and I've been asked to be quiet by our legislators. So we're done being civil and we w are here to hear people. And um, I did gain the skills that I demonstrated here earlier and you can too. So we are here to end police brutality. We are here to defund police. We are here to abolish the police. We are here to make sure that the resources are spent on humanizing people and welcoming people in our community, seeing everyone and looking at the level of human need that isn't met and putting our resources there. So uh, I, I see someone's quite eager to speak, but one thing that hasn't yet been said and addressed is that the Vermont National Guard isn't just damaging our hearing and damaging our brains and damaging children's development with the F-35 planes. The Vermont National Guard has been poisoning our waterways with PFAS chemicals. So those chemicals can be found in the body of every single person who can hear my voice right now. This is not separate from you. And the Vermont National Guard was, Guard was recently exempted by our state legislature from any accountability for stopping using those chemicals even though alternatives exist. So they use those chemicals in the firefighting foams that they use for drills. And they say that that's necessary. And when we ask them, why is there such a high rate of cancer in Vermont? Why are there so many people dealing with major health challenges that don't really have an explanation? And then the institutions that we set up 
are silencing activists and the courts are intimidating people who speak out on behalf of people who are oppressed. And then once in a while, you will hear someone in the city council here say they believe in the system, but what is it that you believe in? Thank you very much. So I'm just going to hand the microphone to Mohammed to wrap up. Uh, so, so, so you know people want to be heard, so, so go ahead, real quick. Uh, yeah, so uh, what is it you believe in? I mean, if you uh, suggest that there are uh, pesticides in the water, <clears throat> then you have to go to the water and figure out what the pesticides, uh, what was the chemical in the water? Uh, but yeah, so like, so like, what do you believe in? Um, so, wow. And then it uh, echoed, um, it bounced off those walls and it bounced off those walls and then it bounced right back to me. <clears throat> and I said, you know, <clears throat> so here I am standing in the middle of a beautiful street in the middle of beautiful commerce <clears throat> and uh, he, he, he shut the camera off. And I said, why did you shut the camera off? I mean, aren't I just talking to you? <clears throat> so so, so, so what, uh, what I was getting to, the, the, the moral of the story was that um, uh, I would ask, um, what is the benefit of... Um, Good talk, good talk. Muhammad, for the closing remarks. Thank you for everybody for being a part of this. Even in your listening, this is important to have community engagement and in a public space, in a public space too. So shout out one more time. All right, yeah, thanks all for coming and uh, appreciate all the speakers. Um, so I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, the Coalition for Solidarity is definitely still accepting um, other organizations that are interested in being a part of it. So reach out to me or Jimmy. Uh, what we're doing right now is we're collecting all the platforms for different organizations so that we can redistribute it back to the members of the coalition so that we can be completely connected and support each other's content. Uh, and then after that, we're just gonna go based off of whatever people want to support. If there's an initiative that people want an event or demonstration or a march, we're gonna help put that together. So that's what this coalition is for. So thank you all for being here, appreciate it. Have a good one, it's a good day. Enjoy the day as you walk. Thank you for everyone who's been speaking and made their voices heard. Have a great day, everyone. Once again, thank you for the Racial Justice Alliance Group, the Black Perspective, and also the community for being represented here today.